am so excited to uh, introduce to you Francesca Cotrufo, who is professor in the Tar Department of Soil and Crop Sciences, Sciences and senior scientist at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at Colorado State University. She was born and raised in Naples, Italy. She's a PhD and professor and associate head in the Department of so Soil and Crop Sciences. And Oh, I already said that. <laughs> Disregard, sorry. Um, Catrufo is a soil ecologist and biochemist and internationally recognized as an authority in the field of litter decomposition and soil organic matter dynamics and in the use of isotopic methodologies in these studies. Her main research interest is in understanding the mechanisms and drivers of formation and persistence of soil organic matter and its response to global environmental changes and disturbances, which is why we love her. She also pursues applied research to propose soil management practices that increase soil health and mitigate climate change, which is why she's speaking on our topic today. She is editor of the journal Global Change Biology. To date, she published over 100 peer-reviewed articles and several book chapters. In 2018, she was recognized for exceptional research performance demonstrated by production of multiple highly cited papers that rank in the top 1% by citation for her field in Web of Science. She is one of our key collaborators, and her work is particularly relevant to our theme this weekend, and so I'm very much looking forward to hearing from her. I welcome to the stage Dr. Francesco, Francesca Cotrufo. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you all for being here. I have to say I've given a lot of lectures and seminars and presentation at conferences, but this is something else. It's, <laughs> it's really amazing to, um, to be here. And, uh, and to think that to you know, talk with you all about something that is really there to me and at the center of my research, as Rachel said, which is soil organic matter, and in particular, it's soil organic matter regeneration in agricultural systems. You know, in my talk, I said it, uh, I wrote it, that is the true human, humanity's capital. And that is because soil organic matter is really foundational and vital to us. It's basically where we grew the, I think 70% of our food is grown on soil. But also soil organic matter is an important reserve of carbon so that it um, uh, contribute to the regulation of climate and uh, um, as well as, you know, control the water. Uh, it's, it's one of the uh, things that control water cycling, neuter recycling, and so forth. So it's really key for us to understand it, to take care of it, to regenerate it, so that we can make humanity going forwards into the future. But before I start uh, talking to you more in depth of what is organic matter, why we care about it, I'd like to start um, telling a little bit you the story of what brought me here, what brought me to study soils. You know, often when you become a professor, people ask you, why are you studying soils and why are you interested in this? And I always wished I had one of these stories like, you know, this amazing middle school teacher that came to school with a soil profile and showed his fascination, or, or having grown on a farm with a grandfather that told me how important soil is, or even in a family that, you know, brought me camping or hiking, and I would dig holes and find those earthworms and think that they were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, I, I really don't have any of these stories. As, <laughs> as Rachel said, I grew up in uh, Naples, Italy, as far from soils as you can get. Um, and, uh, and Naples is uh, an amazing, wonderful 2,000 years old or over 2,000 years old city on the Mediterranean Sea. And actually, my father uh, loved fishing. And so my vacation, we're always on the water. We're always on boats, um, you know, experiencing and searching for the beauty of the Mediterranean, natural and cultural beauty of the Mediterranean um, sea and, and, and coastline. But when I think about it, I think that uh, where I, I did grow up in a family that cared deeply for humanity and its well-being. My father was a uh, cardiovascular surgeon, was a medical doctor, and my grandfather was a medical doctor before him. And my mom was a school teacher, and uh, was because they are both retired, 
Um, and, um, and she actually, uh, you know, she's a very cultured woman, and to today, at nearly 80 years old, she keeps volunteering to provide an education to the least um, wealthy or the least fortunate in our societies. And I, I like to think that that uh, care and that uh, thing for humanity is actually the seed that brought me um, years later to, to think and care about soils. Because again, that's, that's very important for the future of, our, of us on, on the planet. And um, on the other hand, I'm a scientist, and I really should tell you the true stories, um, which is less romantic, but is actually a logic and uh, um, a logic stories of what brought me to think about this. And that is the fact that um, as an ecologist, I started working on climate change and, uh, and in particularly on the effect of elevated CO2 on litter decomposition. I did my PhD in England, um, mostly because ecology at the time wasn't very developed in Italy and I wanted to learn English because I knew that it would have been important to me at some point. Um, and so I went to England to study ecology, and uh, I studied the um, decomposition of um, hardwood forest, natural forest litter on the forest floor, uh, as it was aff affected by the increase of CO2 into the atmosphere. At the time, and now I revealed my age, I guess, it was the early 90s, and CO2 in the atmosphere was 350 ppm. Today, today we are at about 410. Um, and, uh, and many scientists, you know, we were interested in the impact of elevated CO2 and other global changes on natural processes. I guess we were naive enough to think that if we showed the impacts um, of, those, uh, of those changes, uh, global political leadership would have taken immediate action and stop emitting uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. But that never happened, and we have continuously um, emitted and risen the CO2 um, again into the atmosphere. And so years passed and no such important decision were taken, and thus scientists like me uh, moved from the studies of impact to those of mitigation and adaptation to climate changes. But still, no major decision have been taken to halt emission, and the CO2 and other greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere kept rising. This is why in the most recent years, scientists, but I believe also many of you in this audience, have started looking at solutions, including the use of terrestrial ecosystem to actively remove carbon from the atmosphere and bring it back into the soil. Over this year, my research moved from studying the impact of climate change on biogeochemical cycles in natural ecosystems to how we can manage soils to store more carbon and thus help drill down carbon from the atmosphere to avoid a catastrophic disruption of the climate system. This is actually something we knew and many knew um, many years ago that as the CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere, the climate would change and this in fact changed and, and that can disrupt the entire climate system. Anyway, this journey brought me here today to talk to you about why soil organic matter regeneration is key to the future of humanity and why prairies are a key system to achieve it. But in order to make that claim, I need to tell you first the story of what soil organic matter is, how it forms and persists, and the services that it provides to us. In fact, I firmly believe that staying grounded in science, we can identify the most effective management decisions. I'm sorry if, if I stress that, because often as a professor in the university, we are accused of staying in our ivory tower and make research that are not um, you know, important or that are not, uh, don't, don't make an impact. And I actually think that conversations like this are fundamentally important. We do the science, but also want to do the science to help solve problems. And so we need to talk, and this is an amazing event to do that. Like this? Yes. So you haven't heard anything so far? <laughs> Okay, so where we were. Um, 
So I firmly believe that staying grounded in science, we can identify the most effective management decisions which are likely to be different for different systems, soils, climate, and so on. Only a deep scientific understanding of the mechanism that drives soil organic matter regeneration and persistence can thus inform effective ma management solution. So here we go with my accelerated scientific lecture on soil organic matter, or actually sometimes you can hear me say SOM. We love jargon, and SOM is our acronym for soil organic matter. So soil organic matter is an amazingly complex substance, and that's, I guess, is why it's so fascinating, but also very difficult to study. It is made of all the chemical compounds remaining from the decomposition and transformation of all plant detritus and root exudates as they are used by microorganisms and animals in the soil. And by the remains of the bodies and chemicals that, are, that all soil organisms produce. When we measure soil organic matter, we also include in it the living biomass of the entire um, of the soil biota, but that is generally a very minor fraction of the entire soil organic matter. The, the, the majority of the soil organic matter is actually made by the bodies, the dead bodies of the microbes. But if chemically soil organic matter is very complex because of this different origin and state of transformation, Physically, it can have a few distinct forms. And we now believe, or at least I do, uh, that the physical status of organic matter is key to determine its property, capacity to regenerate and resist disturbance. Soil organic matter can be found dissolved in water. Imagine if you percolate water to a soil, your water becomes mm, brown. That brown is the dissolved organic matter that moved into the water. Or it can be particulate, um, and that you can visualize. Oh, I lost it with wind. I had a piece of straw. You can imagine that straw being fragmented in particularly through the action of fauna and make particulate organic matter that comes into the soil um, or be associated to the soil minerals through chemical bonding. And, uh, um, uh, and, and all of those, um, of those fraction, again, in jargon, we call the dissolved organic matter DOM, the particulate organic matter, POM, and the mineral associated organic matter, MAM. So again, I will use it. What is POM? MAM? DOM? You're the best students I've ever had. <laughs> so um, those can be found free or occluded within aggregates. So many of you understand the importance of aggregation. Aggregates are just the house in which this structure can be found and protected. Um, POM and MEOM are fundamentally different for the processes that form them, their role in soil functioning and provision of fertility, and their capacity to withstand disturbance and therefore help mitigating climate change. So, recapping, my first take-home message is that soil organic matter is not a unique pool. And when we talk of regenerating SOM, we should more specifically think of regenerating MAM and POM, because they are different, and eventually how to protect them in aggregates to make their formation more efficient and increase their time of residence in the soil. I will not focus on DOM since while it is a key functional pool, it makes up a very little amount of soil organic matter. It's generally around 1%. Particulate organic matter is largely made of partly decomposed plant residues and fungal hyphae, which fragments also thanks to the action of soil animals, like, for example, earthworms, and incorporate into the soil. For this reason, the majority of POM is light, and that is the way we separate it from the rest of the soil. In the mineral soil, particulate organic matter turns over relatively fast, also possibly contributed to recycling of fertility, 
in particular when it is produced by high quality plants like legumes. That's also why legumes are so important in a community because it pro they produce palm rich in nitrogen, recycle fast and, and, and cycle fertility on top of, of their doing their nitrogen fixation. The mineral associated organic matter is instead made of the product of microbial decomposition of the more nutritious plant components, which, uh, which if they encounter a mineral surface, chemically bond to it, and through this bonding get protected and can stay in soil for centuries or even millennia. Thus, meum represent the most persistent and less vulnerable sun stock. So recapping, Palm is the direct result of structural plant inputs, the fiber into the soil. It is short-lived, and its only form of protection is in soil aggregate, or when it is, it is chemically recalcitrant to decomposition, as in the case of charcoal. So charcoal, when we burn a prairie, it forms charcoal, and that is also light and separated as palm, but it's very recalcitrant and, and can stay for a long time in the soil. Meum, on the other hand, is formed from the labile inputs and their microbial processing. So often at the beginning of the decomposition process, when a fresh input comes on the soil, the first rain wash out that tea, they go into the soil, the microbe love it because it's already accessible, they eat and it's very nutritious so it forms a lot of microbial products and those products can stick to mineral and form that persistent organic matter. So it's not the, the, the recalcitrant residue of plant material that form the stable organic matter but it's quite the opposite. This is a major conceptual transformation from how we used to think of some stabilization. I don't know how many of you have heard of humus, might have studied humus. That's not anymore how we think the soil organic matter form. Before, the prevailing idea was that decomposition of plant inputs would only result in their loss. Thus, we should stop decomposition to preserve soil carbon stocks. Now, we think the true microbial decomposition of plant inputs, the most persistent form of organic matter can be created. Basically, soil biological activity doesn't only consume some, but can also stabilize a fraction of it. This is an important transformative idea, since now we can conceive using some to produce fertility at the same time of protecting some of it in a stable form. In this, in this framework, plant inputs and the efficiency with which microbes transform them become key to soil organic matter management. In the title of my talk, I defined some a humanities capital. So let's stay with this metaphor and think of palm and meum as our checking and saving accounts. Particulate organic matter would be the checking account since it turns over continuously, supporting nutrient recycling, has the checking accounts need to be spent to support our living expenses. However, since we need it to turn over to support our functioning, we also need to keep regular continuous deposits into it. The meum would be the saving accounts. It generally gets a small fraction of the deposit, but is stabilized and remains in stock to support the hard times. It doesn't suffer of large fluctuations unless we stop new deposits. And after having exhausted all the checking, which would be our palm, we start living off of our savings. This is what conventional agriculture has done and continue doing to its soil capital. Having selected for few crops with minimal root production, Harvesting much of the above ground biomass and oftentimes including fallow periods, conventional agricultural systems provide low, chemically homogeneous and discontinuous residue inputs into the soil. Additionally, having broken the only mechanism of protection of palm, which is occlusion in soil aggregates, years of conventional farming have exhausted all the palm that was naturally in soils, which are now incapable of self-supporting, requiring continuous fert fertilizer inputs, and are consuming the meum deposits. A soil science colleague, Dr. Jonathan Sanderman, estimated that conventional agriculture has on average resulted in the loss of about 25%, a quarter 
of all the carbon originally present in the top soils. And in some system, that number was as high as 80%. We clearly cannot continue with conventional management or we will burn off all our capital. To regenerate soil good health, we need to restart a virtuous soil economy, augmenting both pools and ensuring a vital circulation of the capital to support growth while increasing the savings. We all know that to keep our bank accounts healthy, we need to maintain inputs, diversify investment, efficiently manage our spending, best if by recapitalizing, which in our metaphor would be uh, stimulating crop production and input into the soil and protect our savings. This is what natural prairies do with their soil capital. By being perennial, they maintain continuous organic matter inputs into the soil, which support the soil biota and their health and lead to the formation of new soil organic matter. This is further assured by the high biodiversity of natural prairies. We heard it in the song. In particular, the presence of different plant forms, legumes, grasses, and forbs. This diversity on one end maximizes productivity and their four inputs, but also diversifies the chemistry of the inputs and the depth in the soil in which it is deposited. We believe that diversification is key to the production of both palm and male, because it provides a variety of recalcitrant and labile plant components, stimulate diverse microbial groups, and distribute the inputs to a larger volume of soils, in particular to depth. Additionally, in prairies, due to the lack of tillage, soils typically have high degree of soil aggregation, and aggregates promote the efficient formation of male and protect palm from fast decomposition. However, the caveat is that long-term persistence of MAM is assured by the bonding of organic matter to silt and clay minerals, which are thus a required ingredient from MAM production. In general, mineral surface availability increases with depth, and this is why prairie perennial species that develop deep roots are able to form deep soils rich in persistent organic matter. However, texture and mineral surface area are soil properties that we cannot really modify through management, despite biochar amendment may provide surface area, but that's a topic for another conversation. So sandy soils do have an inherent limited capacity to sequester carbon in male. In these soils, POM is even more important, and it is any management practice that favors POM sorry, palm formation and persistence. Should be clear now where I'm going, right? Let's hope so. <laughs> if natural prairie develop healthy soils, in particular on silty loam substrate, converting conventional crop instead to diversified perennial system old promise for building some, and in particular to kickstart a positive soil economy which regenerates soil carbon stocks, but also assure organic matter recycling, thus supporting the natural fertility of soils. This is why a, a geeky soil scientist like me came to the Land Institute. I actually visited the Land Institute in the spring of 2017 with a delegation of Colorado State University scientists. And has Tim drove us around to look at all the amazing experiments that are conducted here, and I believe uh, you guys had an experience of that yesterday. Something really lightened up in me. You know, it was one of these Erica moments. Um, we recently had a grant uh, funded by the USDA with Dr. Megan Shipaski um, on, on how um, intensification and diversification of cropping system would regenerate some, but we were mostly thinking about, you know, including legumes in rotation of, of more conventional um, grain systems. And so when I came here and I, and I learned more about what they were doing here and the perennial systems and, and the possibility of diversifying them with, with legumes, I really thought, yeah, this might be 
the way that the system where I can really test all these hypotheses that I've been talking about, about whole soil organic matter works. And so <clears throat> it was like a yes moment uh, that this was the system where I could best test my hypothesis about how to regenerate some and soil health. And we are now actively pursuing those questions. And my student, Loya von der Poel, has established an experiment here in Kern's alfalfa plots to test these hypotheses and other of their own. But I believe that experiments are limited to the time and space they are conducted. And to better explore the potential of perennialization and diversification to regenerate soils, we need to establish a broad soil monitoring network across multiple farms which underwent or are undergoing the transition to perennial diversified system. This is now a big ambition of mine, and I really love to see it through, hopefully also as a result of conversation like this one. So in closing, and I'm not sure, um, I like to go back to my beginning and to the fact that I was trained as an ecologist and invite you all to think a minute about our world from the, uh, how the world works from the lens of an ecologist and a biochemist. You know, in, in the simplest term, we can think of our planet Earth as functioning um, largely uh, because of the capacity of plants to transform light energy into biochemical energy and the capacity of microorganisms to mineralize those biomass and recycle the nutrients. So it's mostly plant bringing them the energy and then the microbe recycling it and recycling the nutrient, make the work uh, going. Animals, if you think about that, well, what do animals do? They basically dissipate the excess energy that the plants produce and accelerate the nutrient recycling. And so thinking about that, maybe that's why we have become the most successful animal species on the planet. I think that no one knows better than humans how to dissipate energy and accelerate nutrient recycling. So I before used a metaphor from our economic world to discuss soil organic matter functioning. But actually, I'm a firm believer of the opposite. We should use our ecological understanding to guide our socioeconomic systems. I I told you before that I came from Naples, Italy, and you know, in uh, high school I was on a classical lyceum. I studied philosophy and history and ancient Greek and ancient lady. And uh, the, um, I'm very happy that I had that, um, uh, you know, the background in me. Um, but for sure, the, the prevailing idea of those is, is supposed the most prestigious school in, in Europe. And um, the schooling system, you know, to go to a classical lyceum is when you are a very good student, you go there. Um, and they teach basically no skills whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but, um, but the idea is that, you know, humanity needs to learn from history and from their own mistakes and from what they did. And while I think that that's very, very important, and unfortunately never happened, it seems to me like we keep going back and do the same mistake over and over again for millennia. Um, I, I actually think that we don't just need to learn from each other, but we have to learn from the natural systems. And you know, today we live in a society based on the false, on the false premise that competition generates advantages and continuous growth based on consumption of resources is the main goal. While in nature, this may be true, may be at the individual or population level, it's certainly not the case at the ecosystem level. Ecosystems persist when they are most efficient at their resource use and more resilient or, or resistant to disturbance. Resilient, productive ecosystem are typically characterized by a high number of positive relationships. So the key thing in a stable ecosystem is diversity and integration of diversity and the use of that diversity that evolve into a positive mutualistic and symbiosis relationship. 
Um, that also bring to have multiple and diversified process pathway. Production in ecosystem is never, or in the stable, resilient ecosystem, is never done with one species doing one thing, but is assured by a, a, a multiple, what I say, diversified process pathways. And always the best, the, the most resilient process have an efficient, often closed loop in the use of their resources. We heard about the recycling songs, but actually we do need, you know, closed system that recycle their nutrients inside it. I believe we should start understanding the real principles that govern healthy, resilient ecosystems and adopt them not only to best manage our agroecosystem, but also in our socio-economic systems. Natural prairie can teach us how to manage the land to regenerate soils, but natural prairie can also teach us how to manage societies to regenerate humanities. Thank you. Are there anything like prairies in Europe or other places that uh, might be like this? So Europe has 4% of its territory that has not been modified by humans, uh, and that is in the northern Scandinavia. Um, Europe has a, you know, over two thousand millennia of history of, of, um, of, of human management. So the land has been highly transformed, but of course there are prairies um, that, uh, there are few prairies that are like that. A lot of the prairies in Europe are also uh, fertilized and managed heavily for, um, so it's, it's hard to find, and you know, there isn't wilderness in Europe. Um, uh, but there are some remnants and, 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 some, and some prairie that have been, um, that are maintained as natural systems. I mean, I, I travel quite a bit. I believe that in South America there, there are quite a lot. And um, uh, yeah, in the, the uh, I should. Mm? Yeah, the Asian steppes. I, I, I haven't visited that. They might, for sure, the tall grass prairie is an amazing ecosystem. There are a lot of grasslands, but when they are in drier sites or in, uh, uh, you know, on worst soil substrate, um, they don't flourish as much as, as this one. But for sure, there are examples in other places of the world. Just to keep the peace, the people you, these two have microphones, okay? So the microphones are, so you can make eye contact with the microphone holders and, and, and be next. You want to start back here and then we'll go to Leonard. Sure. Um, I asked this question yesterday on the tour and I've been thinking about it more. Um, you spoke this morning about the importance of diversity, but when we looked at the plot, we saw Kernza planted with alfalfa. And that's two species, and then if you count cattle as the third species, um, that's kind of where I get stuck with uh, these perennial plants, is that that's three species. Now, my question is, do the depths of the roots of both alfalfa and Kernza make up for the lack of diversity on, um, on well, on both the top and the bottom of the soil. Yeah, that's a good point, and it's actually one of the reasons we are, you know, we need to do the science to, to, to make those claims. Um, what is important is the functional diversity. And so, as I was saying, you know, grasses, legumes, forbs, so if 
if we build an agricultural system that even if it doesn't have many of each type, but it has the type that are important to bring that, um, that diversity of structure for the microbes, maybe we can do it. For sure, you know, we still need to have agricultural system. We need, still need to produce food for the nine billion people on the planet. So a compromise needs to happen at some point. Thank you very much. I genuinely liked your presentation. I know you are a very, very good person, but you said something towards the end that triggered me <laughs> because it can be misunderstood by people who want to misunderstand. When you said something about we need to use our ecological understanding for organizing society, something, how can, can you elaborate? How can we el um, combine the principles of social justice and ecological integrity? That is really important because in ecology, there are no human rights. So, and I know there are political forces that would like to interpret the, um, the sort of biological sort of survival of the fittest as a kind of social theory as well. I was actually going exactly there. I, I think that we have only taken the evolutionary idea of the survival of the fitness to base our competitive model. Um, and that is an individualistic point that is surely still in nature, but it's not at the point of the basis of an ecosystem that function. It doesn't care who's there to function. It cares that an, a stable ecosystem has to have the diversity of those functions so that if it's dry, it kicks in the one that are most productive when it's dry, and if it's wet, it kicks in the one that are most productive when it's wet. And so the fitness of the ecosystem is assured by the presence of diverse uh, um, uh, entities uh, or group of organisms because that's the other thing that they, no organism work alone. They always work in, uh, um, uh, um, you know, in, in, in for microbes, for microbes we call it co-metabolism. They, microbes don't, don't, are not even able to generate their food by them, themselves. They need to have different group of microbes to to generate all the exoenzyme that they need to produce their food. Uh, so I wasn't, um, what I meant is we actually within the human rights, we need to understand that the diversity of humans is, is more, it enriches and stabilizes society if we embrace it and work together. That's where I wanted to, to go. I, I wanted to point out that the prairie, right here, <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, the prairies actually were occupied and managed, but they were not managed by hierarch hierarchies, which we laughingly call civilization, as in Europe and frankly in the Andes. It, they were managed by people who had managed burns, who made sure that there was a diverse system, who were pastorless, and they managed it, but they did it in a mode of sharing rather than accumulation. Very good. Maybe one more here? Oh, oh uh, I could think of about 15 questions, but I'll keep it to one real basic. So legumes add nitrogen to the soil. When do they do that? When they die or while they're growing? And when, when is that nitrogen made available in the soil? So when they are growing, uh, they bring new nitrogen into the systems through the, again, and in very important symbiosis with uh, bacteria in their roots. So they, they create nodules and, and they fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. They basically are able to do the Uber brush process that we, con you know, we consume fossil fuel to produce nitrogen the way in which legumes do by the energy of the light. 
and, and they bring nitrogen into the soil together working with a different organism, um, a microorganism in the soil. Also, because they have this um, high nutritious, um, you know, the possibility of access so much nitrogen, their tissues are very nutritious. They have, we measure the, 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 the nitrogen in relation to carbon, we call it the carbon to nitrogen ratio plant tissues, and the legume have a very low one. So also when uh, legume are um, returned to the soil, and so after dying, uh, they bring palm that can fastly recycle and um, as well has produced meum from their soluble components. And that's why um, um, legumes are often used also for cover crops. But they're not, like with the curza and the alfalfa, that, that alfalfa isn't helping the curza in that growing season. Yes, it can. Yeah, and I, I mean, I've only seen the data that Tim showed me, but it seems like if you put a, a, a legume in the currents of plots, it performs as well as if when you fertilize it with mineral fertilizer. Francesca, they, they it usually takes two to three years for the alfalfa to develop a larger pool of the soil organic nitrogen for the currents to benefit. So it is, it is the case that it may leak a little bit in, uh, all the time, but it is the expectation of the legume being able to maintain the currents of productivity in real time is not what's happening. I mean, it, you need it, it to establish, and you yes. need to establish the root system. It's like you know a baby, you come, but, but, but once it's established, it's doing its life that does the, the, the fixation. And in the fifth year of some of these intercrops, they are going to town, okay, so it, it really does accumulate over time. <laughs>